and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and I'm here to ask my co-host, Matt Freeman, just a few questions. What kind of questions? I don't like tests. Don't worry about it, Matt. You're in a desert, walking along the sand, when all of a sudden you look down and see a tortoise. I, I kill it. Wait, what? Why? Don't trust anything with a shell. Like a robot shell? Oh, shit. I gotcha. Got me. Got me this time. (laughs) This week on the show, Deconstructing Ridley Scott continues with the director's third film, 1982's seminal sci-fi classic. Um, I feel like I'm going to be saying the phrase seminal sci-fi classic a lot on this 26-part series. But this week, we're talking about Blade Runner. Um, And which cut of Blade Runner are we talking about? Well, you'll have to wait until that segment for... for (laughs) For us to tell you. That's right. Uh, after we finish our conversation about Blade Runner and Ridley Scott, we are going to do a quick uh, media update. This is what we kind of what we wanted to do last week, Matt, but I'm changing it a little bit because this time we're talking about Netflix because there's a lot to talk about with Netflix right now. And if you've been checking the news, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Yep. Um, quite a lot. Yeah. And then we are going to do a a new segment, or at least we're going to introduce a new segment that you'll see featured on some future episodes called TV Trade Off, where Matt and I trade off television shows to watch, to force each other to watch. Uh, We were going to announce this last week, and then we talked about the movie Alien for five hours and didn't have time to do it. So we're doing it this week, I promise. All right. All right, Matt, let's get right into Blade Runner. I was looking for six replicants in a city of 106 million people. You ever see this girl, huh? Never seen a buzz love. What I didn't know was they were looking for me. What is this movie all about? A Blade Runner must pursue and terminate four replicants who stole a ship in space and have returned to Earth to find their creator. Blade Runner was written by Hampton Francher and David Webb Peoples, based on the short story by Philip K. Dick, was, of course, directed by Sir Ridley Scott, and stars Harrison Ford, Rutger Howard, and Sean Young, as well as uh, some other actors that have gone on to wonderful, great things. Matt, what, I, guess, I guess the place to start here with Blade Runner is, is perhaps, what is your history with this movie? Because this is another movie that we had both seen before. This was not a new experience for either of us. But before we get into the details of Blade Runner, what is your experience with this movie? You know, I, I've seen it a bunch of times and I've always um, regarded it as one of those great sci-fi classics. One funny thing keeps happening to me recently and specifically with these, with these last two Ridley Scott movies, which is I'll be watching the movie and I'll be like, this I'm, I'm I'm seeing things I don't remember ever seeing before, and I don't I I actually honestly kind of suspect that it's just I've literally been watching movies so inattentively for my entire <laughs> life that when I have to sit down to really study them for the sake of this podcast, it's sort of the first time I've actually watched the movie as if I were in a movie theater. Let's say because obviously I never watched Blade Runner or Alien in a movie theater. Sure. Um, and I notice way more stuff and it kind of feels like a different movie. Um, so I will. So that's one thing I want to sort of say up front is like this was such a different experience for me that I kind of felt like I was watching a different movie. But the other weird thing about that is also this is a cut of the film I've never seen. Mm. So maybe I am watching a different movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, it's difficult to say and we're not going to go in a lot of detail about the differences between the cuts because we could do an entire show just about that. Um, I think we will say here that you and I both watched the final cut as it, it was termed. This is, I think, the most recent cut to come out. Uh, it is the one that I own on 4K uh, disc because um, they made a 4K version of this, which, by the way, it looks phenomenal in 4K. The movie looks so good. I couldn't believe how good this movie looked. It was wonderful. And I think the final cut is also the one that is currently on Netflix, which is why you watched it, correct? Correct. But there so are overall, seven cuts of this movie, that, Matt. There are so, seven cuts of this movie. That's just so offensive. Um, <laughs> so so the, the final cut, by the way, apparently Ridley Scott did have like final artistic sign off on it. So that's another reason why I think I approve of it. Um, yeah, a lot of people yeah. have a lot of opinions about different cuts. The original cut actually had 
uh, the sort of Nor voiceover, which um, we'll talk about later. I don't want to talk about it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but but anyway, um, overall, I've always really liked this movie, and and I but but I feel like I have new stuff to say after this intensive viewing. Sure, sure. I, I definitely do as well. I think this is one of those movies that I've I definitely saw before, but I think I only saw this movie one time. I think I only saw this movie one time and I watched it because like this is a movie that if you are a movie lover, you have to watch it. And so I had to check it off on the list. I didn't have any real strong opinions about it. Like I, it's not that I thought it was a bad movie or anything. I just didn't care a, a, a lot about it. Um, I, I, I felt so much more strongly about my my journey with Blade Runner 2049 than I ever felt about this movie. But like you, having to sit down and watch it and really think about it for the first time, I found myself really entranced by it. And I think it it is, you know, has any director had a one-two punch like Alien and Blade Runner? You know, like it, it's pretty remarkable that these movies came one after another. And yes, there's technically a three-year gap in between them, but still like for a director to come out the gate with the duelists, then land with Alien and then follow that up with a Blade Runner. It's just pretty, pretty remarkable. Yeah, he defines sci-fi space Lovecraftian horror and then he defines uh, cyberpunk noir. And, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's just incredible. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, let's let's get into the, uh, this in a little bit more detail, Matt. I, wh- where, where do you want to begin with, with um, Blade Runner? You know, I think I actually want to say a couple things about the difference between the voiceover and the not voiceover cut. Sure. Um, when I, I used to say that I liked the voiceover, which I know a lot of people will, will scoff at, but I can, I think I can v- clearly and succinctly explain why, especially after watching this this viewing. So there's no there's no voiceover in the final cut that I just watched, and when there's no voiceover. You have no idea who the hell Deckard is. <laughs> he, you, you know, you know nothing about him, nothing about his background, um, intentionally so, right? His apartment is like full of random pictures in a way where where you you sort of, especially by the end, feel like maybe these are just random pictures that were given to him because he's a goddamn replicant mm-hmm. um, and he has no past. Um, you you don't really know what he's thinking at any point and and Harrison Ford is playing a very sort of reserved very reserved performance most of the time with sort of flashes of of emotion here and there and then in contrast to that with the voiceover it's a completely different movie because you're hearing his stream of consciousness as he's go, as he's going about things you you know everything he thinks about everything and he's and it it literally transforms him into a different character and and it's a more approachable character he feels like a protagonist yeah in this in, in this cut i feel like batty rudger Hauer is the protagonist of the movie and um and and deckard is is just this asshole who's going around murdering these poor replicants yeah. he's a psychopath with a gun that's killing and raping and and, and everyone yeah. you know it, it's yeah i i'm totally with you like I understand why the suits looked at this movie and said, you got to add some fucking voiceover to this thing Mm -hmm. because what's happening here is incomprehensible. Like I totally, I totally get that. And I think a lot of that has to do with Harrison Ford's performance, which is something we'll talk about. Um, and, and, and the, the difficulty of the movie as a whole, I get, I get why they did that. And, and I do, there are parts of me that like it despite Harrison Ford's phoned in line reading. Mm-hmm. But I do think that this cut in particular opened up the movie to me in a new kind of way where I'm so thankful that I have no idea who Harrison Ford is, that I have n- that, that Deckard is this kind of mysterious anomaly who we get hints and, and, and little pieces of who he might have been before the movie started. But it's not ever really clear. Um, and he's just kind of this this tabula rasa who you can put as much emotion or, or reason into the things that he's doing as you want, but there's really nothing there on the surface. I, I, I think it's key to what the movie's actually doing actually. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, like I, I, I understand the desire to put voiceover in it, but I think it's just better without it for sure. It's, it's absolutely the minimum application of noir tropes to establish he's, he's your d- detective character. 
But yeah. then he's doing horrible things all the time. And and it really like I, I, it was interesting to me because I feel like every previous time I've watched this movie, I've kind of been rooting for him. And this time I was honestly not. Yeah. I was like, I wish that the I wish the replicants would all get away, and I, I wish that I wish that Pris would kill him <laughs> because yeah. I don't like him. Um, he's horrible. Um, it, th- his horribleness, I feel, is really emphasized in this cut. Honestly, I, I totally agree with that, and I think that is you know that's that's the movie, right? I mean, like mm-hmm. this is this is the thing is we're it's kind of established right away that these replicants are slaves they are slaves they're kept as property and the the these four replicants that we follow throughout the course of the movie have the audacity to escape from their bondage and attempt to just live a life you know mm-hmm. like like they're great like you know the the, the summary you read at the top said have returned to earth to find their creator which is not really true i mean what 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 they're doing here is trying to figure out how to not die right yeah. um they know that they have a limited lifespan or or at least roy batty does and he's trying to figure out how not to die the other ones seem to just be like i'm just gonna like um i'm just gonna like live like one of them just gets a job mm-hmm. <laughs> and then i think uh it's uh it's zora who just becomes a dancer you know and she's just living her life dancing in this club they're just like trying to exist and then here comes harrison Ford with this big loud boom gun to just shoot them in the fucking back for no reason and and yeah i mean i think him being this kind of blank slate incomprehensible character really helps sell each and every one of those moments where you're just like jesus you're a monster and what you're doing here is monstrous. And yeah. I think, I think the thing that to me that clarifies this the most is the scene that I remember just not knowing what to do with in my first watch of the movie, which is the sex scene with Rachel, uh-huh. um, which, you know, I, I, I there, a lot of, a lot of ink has been spilled talking about the scene, which is basically rape. I mean, he like, she tries to leave and he forces the door shut and then like forces her to sleep with him and then and then basically she ends up just relenting um that's that's rape right and it's weird and i think i think at the time you know like like why would why would you do this why would you put this in the movie and i think it in this in this cut at least it made it crystal clear to me it's like oh because he doesn't see her as a person right and so it's not rape to him because she's a thing she's property yeah. and you can tell property what to do and and the the problem is right now the thing that he's doing right now is he's developing feelings for her and he doesn't know what to do with that because she's supposed to be a thing and it it taps into his own personal doubts about his personality and personhood and existence and so he responds to that by just treating her as a thing in the most direct and possible way which is to to take her you know yeah. um and it's not good. And and it is a little weird that by the end of the movie, she's like, I, I love you. <laughs> He's like, I love you too. You know, but I, I think it is part of his his journey into dealing with who he is, which which I'm just going to say up front, Deckard is a replicant. Like he just, he just is. He just is. I, I don't know why this is a debate. I, I definitely was a, of course, De- Deckard's not a replicant. You're crazy um, person <laughs> for most of my life. But I will just say, like, it's pretty evident in this cut. There's, there's sufficient, there's sufficient moments where it's like, uh, well, this moment doesn't make any sense if he's not a replicant, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it, like, this moment is just artistically superfluous if the point isn't to, to throw doubt on that, at, at the very least to throw doubt on it. And, and I think the last scene of the movie cements it. Um, but yeah, no, what, what you were saying about the, about just the emphasizing his badness, like, it's uh, i'm just gonna you know compare and contrast with the, the sort of creepy han solo um uh, uh sexual pressure scene <laughs> which is which is which is well known where he has princess leia the millennium falcon mm-hmm. and like like this is even this is much worse than that <laughs> because yes. he's like angry he like gets uh-huh. furious because she rejects him and like storms after her and slams the door and like shoves yeah. her again like it's very it's it's very obvious that he's angry and and is is upset that he's been rejected um it's just completely 
terrible. And like for me on this viewing anyway, like that was a moment that I turned against him even more than I was already turned against him. Mm -hmm. Although uh, actually the scene where he shoots Zora in the back was also a bit where I was like, how did I ever watch this movie before (laughs) and have the impression that this was the good guy? Yeah. I mean, the way Scott chooses to shoot that scene is so transparent to me. And again, I like I it's been so long since I've seen this movie and I don't even remember what fucking cut of the seven it was that I watched the first time. It Mm -hmm. definitely wasn't this one. So I don't know if there was changes in this, but like the slow motion way in which she is running as fast as she can away from this man. She's wearing this like translucent um, like raincoat looking thing, which shows a lot of her skin. So she's, she's not naked, but she's very exposed. Right. And, and the way in which Scott like slows down time and has her like her dying grasp be to just like throw herself through a plate glass window in her desperate attempts to get away from him. And in the slow, it's, it's a fucking horror tragedy moment it, like there's no other way to read that scene than you're supposed to be absolutely horrified and disgusted by this whole thing yeah yeah absolutely i mean it's interesting because um i do have to admit i feel like maybe some of my thoughts on this movie have have cross-pollinated with my thoughts on blade runner 2049 sure because the the whole idea of the of, of the replicants as an oppressed slave class is much more textually front and center in 2049. Um, the idea that, that, you know, the character in that movie who is effectively the same guy as Tyrell is Jared Leto and he's super evil and awful. And he's just obviously the antagonist. Whereas in this movie, you just sort of feel like Tyrell is, you know, at worst, he's just like, Oh, he's just, he's just a rich CEO. Yeah, he's just he's, a smarmy business guy. But like he's he is actually worse than being a smarmy business guy. Like mm-hmm. okay, he lives in a giant pyramid like a god. <laughs> um he he his 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 decor is all like gold and, and and ostentatious and it kind of reminds you of like you know a um uh you know the the, the grave goods of some of some Egyptian pharaoh or something. Yeah. And and um, I mean, there's all sorts of symbolism around him that, that we could pick out, but I'm I'm just choosing to emphasize the bit where it's like, yeah, he subtextually he is um, a a really bad dude. It's just it's less obvious, and it, at least it was less obvious to me. Um, well, that's I mean, that's because 2049 plays him by with with Jared Leto in the most absurd, ostentatious performance ever. That really takes the it's it's almost as if um the movie takes the background in which this character is and makes that his personality as well whereas this version of the movie has this like ostentatious absurd background and place that he lives and and stuff and yet he's nor he's just seems like a kind of a normal business dude mm-hmm. um which is a choice i i i kind of like it better here it's more subtle i love blade runner 2049 don't get me wrong but i love that he just comes off as this normal business guy and no actually he's he's really horrible if if you don't if you don't pause long enough to really think about it i mean i think this is really reinforced in the in the scene with him and and roy batty right where he roy comes to him basically like begging him to tell him how how can i preserve my life how can i continue to live and he basically in 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 the most cold you know non empathetic way possible is like there's there's no way we can't do it no there's Mm -hmm. literally it's impossible everything you're thinking about it's tried it's been done we built you the best we could uh we can't we can't extend your life and then at the end of that roy is just kind of like he's he's first of all dealing with the the truth of that and and that means he's doomed and he kind of is like well fuck my life's about to end and i've done really terrible things in my short life like mm-hmm. I've been made to do these terrible, terrible things. And his creator's response to that is like, no, 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 you did. You did great things because you look at you. You're, you're I made you. You're, you're great. You did great things. And that's what kind of tips him over the edge and makes him fucking <laughs> uh, thumb the guy's eyes out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 this this it's like it's it's kind of like I mean, you can frame it as a son going to their father and being like, father, I've done bad. Please please forgive me for the bad things I've done. I mean, look, look, he's Jesus, right? Like, I mean, (laughs) Roy Batty 
is Jesus. He gives himself a stigmata at the end of the movie. And so this is almost as if Jesus Christ is going to God and saying, Father, why do I have to die? And his father saying, sorry, you gotta, and him saying, okay, but I did all this bad stuff. And he's not forgiving him of the bad stuff he's did. He's just saying, actually, no, you didn't do anything wrong. It's as if God is saying, no, 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 there's no such thing as sin. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Come goodbye, Jesus. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that. I mean, he, he, I think he literally calls him the prodigal son too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is, I've always thought a really interesting story because it it, it the the more the, i've always thought the moral of that story was kind of interesting because it's not it's not like don't worry son i forgive you it's like there's nothing to forgive mm-hmm. is is the subtext which is the same thing that you're saying here um and yeah i mean i think that's that's interesting for sure there's a thread that 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 really scott is going to carry through a lot of his movies and it was started here i think this this idea of um the the android you know this and this android isn't quite the right word for what replicants are even though we use it all the time it's the the person who was made by another person (laughs) is a better word the 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 synthetic person who is nonetheless still a person um goes goes to meet his creator begging for more life um because he feels like he's got a raw deal and his creator is like no sorry you know and he gives him some platitude like uh the light that burns twice as bright burns half as long which i'm sure doesn't make him feel any better well it's it's yeah i mean it's it's useless and it's like the the truth is that we it's not that you're so amazing that you can't survive as long we're told earlier in the movie that they literally made them with this lifespan because they were worried about them being too becoming too independent Mm -hmm. and, and evolving beyond their ability to control them. So like it's entirely artificial. They don't need to die this early. It's it's, they made a choice to do this. Yeah. And, and plus as, as we've, as we've said, they're, they're smarter and stronger and better than people too. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. which is, it just kind of amplifies the kind of horror of, of, of making these people who are better than people. And then, yeah. Oh, you know, they, they die young because they're too dangerous. Um, yeah. There's always the interesting, the interesting stuff with the eyes in this movie that I just, I see it as a cool, um, a cool artistic touch, the kind of thing that, um, kind of thing that Ridley Scott, you know, would do, which I, yeah. I just, so, so this isn't a criticism. It's just, it's funny to me how consistently in the movie, um, all the, all the replicants have obvious, tapetum lucidum like 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 reflective yeah. pupils like a cat uh including rachel yep e- even in the first scene um which is funny to me because you would think that instead of bothering to do an elaborate void comp test you would just look at their eyes but <laughs> but i'm i'm and I'm, I'm, not, I'm joking because it's like it that's totally a ridley scott thing of being like sh- shut up it looks cool obviously you shouldn't care about that um it, it looks yeah. awesome just, I, I just mean, I have on. a question. I have a question about the Voight comp test because it is like one of the most uh, long standing, you know, cultural touchstones of this whole thing. Right. Like the mm-hmm. the random questions that you find a tortoise, it's, it's flipped on its back. What do you do? But like, I don't quite understand in practice why this thing exists, because like for our replicants in this movie, he has their pictures from the start. He knows exactly <laughs> uh-huh. who the replicants are. And like. If they're manufactured humans, wouldn't we know what each and every one looks like? And wouldn't they just send that information to the Blade Runners hunting them? Like, I don't understand the, yeah. the overall concept in the world that is created here that like replicants are are hiding amongst us. And the only way to discover them is through this very elaborate, um, metaphorical, interesting test, which, by the way, like I love, I love the test. I love the idea. I love it metaphorically and what it's saying, but just like logically within the frame of the movie, I was kind of like, huh, why, why do they do this? Why don't they just get a picture from central command of what the replicant looks like? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's exactly the kind of question that I, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that really Scott doesn't care about. <laughs> no, he does not. Yeah, that's for um, sure. But, but like, cause I mean, even in so okay this is one thing where on this viewing i got something that i never gotten 
okay, I've got I got, I got two things I've never gotten before. Um, the first is that the guy who's who's interrogating Le, Le, Leroy is it Leroy? No, it's Leon. Is it Leon? No, yeah, the um, Leon. Yeah, yeah. The the, the strong strong boy the replicant. St- strong boy. Um, the guy who's inter- interrogating Leon is a Blade Runner. Um, mm-hmm. m- maybe this is obvious to everyone, but I, I literally only got it on this viewing. I thought he was just like a guy who was interviewing people for a job at the Tyrell building. And this was part of the interview. Like like a Voight Kampf test was just naturally part of the interview because they wanted to make sure that Blade Runners weren't sneaking in. And Which I, I don't know how I confabulated that. When in reality, the movie is pretty clear that this is a guy who it, he, he's a he's a Blade Runner working for the police who went to interview all the new hires at Tyrell and found that Leon was indeed trying to sneak into the Tyrell building um, as a new hire and mm. then blows him away. So like th- that was the, like on, on one level, obviously, I'm going to blame myself for being dumb and missing things. But on another level, I think it speaks to how sort of narratively mumbly this movie is that you can just sort of miss things like this like i I feel like a thing one scene that i've that i know i've seen like three or four different versions of is the scene where he's talking with the police chief and they're and they're looking at the videos of the of the replicants faces Mm -hmm. like I i feel like i've seen at least three or four radically different cuts of that conversation um and I think the reason is that it's kind of a long, boring conversation. <laughs> and and so the the tendency in certain cuts has been to just not have it. And then if you don't have it, then you never actually learn that that guy was a Blade Runner, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't think it's entirely my fault. I'll, I'll take 60% of the credit for being an well, idiot one of the, here. One thing, and I'm not 100% sure on this, but that, that Blade Runner's name is Holden. And he dies in the opening scene, right? He gets right. shot to death. And then when um when the police chief pulls in Deckard to kind of put him on the case, I I think and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think he says, "Why don't you put Holden on it?" and he's just like, "He's busy." And it's cuz he's dead. <laughs> um and and I don't think he ever tells that to Deckard. I don't think he ever, you know, reveals that fact to him, which is interesting cuz he's looking at the tape um and presumably like sees what happens in that whole exchange. But I don't think, I don't think he says that. Um, Mm. And that is part of like, here's another question for you. One of the things is he, he says like Bryant, the chief brings him in and says like, you're the best we have. I need you. You're the best at this. What is it that Decker does over the course of this movie that makes him the best blade Runner? He's obviously like a barely functional alcoholic. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess he does the snake scale thing, which is pretty astute detective work to find that tiny little scale and then like do the the, the five minutes of computer enhance uh-huh. to get to the picture of the girl in the mirror with a little bit of scales on her. And that leads him down, like, I guess. But like it doesn't like especially the end of the movie, like he just gets his ass beat. And then the only reason he wins is because Roy Batty like lets him. Yeah, right. Um no, he, he there's there's nothing particularly special about him. I mean, you could argue you could hand wave something like um well, okay. I, I think the real answer might be something like he's a replicant and they know that and so they're going to uh-huh. throw their dis, the, the replicant to chase the replicants because maybe they figure that he'll think like them. Maybe yeah. they figure it doesn't matter anyway because he's a disposable person. Um who knows. Um it, that that's that's the kind of thing where like we said earlier like you don't really know his background or where he comes from or or any of that it's the scantiest possible background information um Mm -hmm. and you know like even even like the stuff like where the you know he's like i don't want to do it i'm not going to do it And, and the chief the chief's threat is like if you're not cop you're little people and then harrison ford is like okay i'll do it and you're like what 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 did that mean? Like was that a <laughs> was that a threat? Was that a? Yeah. I mean, I guess it was a subtle. I guess it was a th- th- subtle subtextual threat, which I'll I'll, I'll buy that. It's just it's, it's the kind of thing where the movie is really leaving you to make a lot of inferences, and which, yeah, which you can kind of enjoy about the movie. 
but at, at the same time, it does leave you with this feeling of confusion in some places. Yeah, I, I, and and we've talked about this on the show before. I think confusion is okay. I think mm-hmm. it's okay to be confused. And I think one of the things I love most about this movie is that it doesn't really do a lot of legwork at, at building the world. You know, we, we kind of are are just dumped into this world this we see it's it's 2019 which every time i see that that makes me feel old as shit that uh-huh. it's, it was technically three years ago um we get the idea that this is like kind of an oppressive society you know there are giant corporations and billboards everywhere and and like police presence constantly everywhere but we don't really go into detail on exactly how the world got this way or why this happened or or what is the what is the what is, what is the state of the government? What is the state of freedom? I, I think we know we're in L.A. Um, it doesn't look like our L.A. I love actually, especially on the 4K, I love the opening scene where it's just the city and like there are these plumes of fire shooting up from these smokestacks and then giant bolts of electricity coming from the sky. This this mix of electricity and fire over this this. It, it, forever city as far as the eye can see it's such a wonderful oppressive powerful image and really that's that's like the most legwork the movie does in establishing the world um we get mm-hmm. these vague notes about like you know off planet stuff and um the the replicants are being used as slaves and obviously some of them are, are being used as soldiers as well uh, but to fight who for why to what end and none of that is filled in and i like that i like I like not having a full grasp of this world, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, so, so, so I, I definitely want my my whining about things being muddled <laughs> to be taken um, in a in a in a nuanced way because it's like, yeah, um, if you're if you're going to to do this, you know, this sort of artistic style of 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 you know narratively drawing with as few lines as possible you know just just leaving you with 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 a feeling and a, and a suspicion and a hunch about what's going on mm-hmm. um then there's going to be stuff that's confusing and yeah. um you know I, I think this is this is kind of one of the things that that i think we're already picking up about really scott is that it's not that he doesn't care about plot and narrative but i think he cares much more about just like Am I am I crafting a unique and interesting visual and and feeling to go along yeah. with it? And um Yeah, because it's not even character, really. Yeah. Like it's not like I don't care about plot, I care about character. That is I, I, I we've seen that a lot. We've said that statement about some some directors. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's Ridley Scott. I mm-hmm. think the only character in this movie is is Redgar Hauer, is Roy Batty, right? Like I, I don't think Deckard's actually a character in the traditional sense of the word. And I really don't think anyone else is. I mean, I I guess Rachel a little bit, um, Pris maybe a little bit, uh, you know, but it's just, it's not really focused on character either. It's focused on mood. It's focused on feeling. It's focused on ideas in a very broad sense. Um, And I think you're absolutely right that that is, that is where Ridley Scott lives. Yeah. No, one character that jumped out to me as being, as being kind of more, uh, interesting to me than, than he had been in the past is actually um, Sebastian um, mm-hmm. JF Sebastian the 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 engineer who they you know I, I don't know entrap blackmail um, <laughs> murder because um, because like he he seems like such an interesting like he, he makes up a very small part of the movie but like everything about him and his existence and the situation he's put into is so fascinating. I love the performance yeah. where he's like terrified and, and he, he's kind of actually heartbroken at first where he's like, Oh, I like, I thought I made a friend and it turns out that she was actually just suckering me. And yeah. Um, like you can, you can see in, in the performance him, him like realizing that n- not only is she not actually his friend, but he's totally boned. Um, and he, and, you know, he becomes terrified uh, it, it's a it's a great you know it's a great part of the movie actually and um, there's a small part of the movie but I think it's great. No, you're so right. I mean, just the just like his life, he lives in this incredibly ornate but run down and abandoned giant building, mm-hmm. and he's the only one living there. He he crafts these toys, which are these incredibly lifelike looking um, 
you know, toy soldier and other things that are just kind of constantly moving around in his, in his building. Um, and he just lives this lonely life. And we learn also that he's got this, a, a very similar disease to what is the replicants mm-hmm. are suffering from is he's aging prematurely. I think he's, we're told he's only 25, but he mm-hmm. looks like a man in his forties or fifties. And, and yeah. so he is, he, he has a lot in common with these replicants and yeah, they do kind of just, just use him and, and lose him. It's, it's, it's a very sad yeah. story. I think, you know, this is really one of the few windows we get into like just what life is like in this world for just regular people. Mm -hmm. Um, that this is the way people just live now because they don't know what else to do and how else to exist or function in this world. Yeah. Right. Like, like, uh, there, there's no, there's no normalcy left. Mm -mm. You know, one thing that, that, that I, maybe I, maybe this is a new realization, maybe not, but just like, I'm pretty sure all of the quote unquote toys that he makes are like flesh and blood creatures, just like the replicants. Like, I don't think they're like clockwork. I think they're like, little guys which leads to all sorts of horrifying ideas where it's like this <laughs> you know this little this little soldier guy like, like okay so so like when when he's when he's talking to Pris in one of the scenes it keeps cutting to the soldier guy like mm-hmm. reacting to what's happening in the conversation in this kind of creepy way and you're like oh my god this is like a this is like a little weird person that he's made yeah well and then there's the scene where like he's sebastian's asleep and pris is like sneaking up on him Mm -hmm. and the this toy soldier guy like looks concerned and worried about his creator and you're just like how 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 real are these like how much how close to personhood are these things that's that were just that are treated entirely as objects throughout the course of the movie like that's the thing is they're probably like lesser versions of replicants where they're yeah. like they're, they're they're like maybe not as smart as a person maybe they have more like specific programming like that that that's the thing little soldier man extremely minor and irrelevant part of the story but just like as a background element you're like what the that's so <laughs> fucked up actually if you if you yeah. think about it yeah. um that's which again it's it's uh like just the decision to keep cutting to him during that scene, it really emphasizes like, Oh, he's aware of what's happening in this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Scott does such a good job with that throughout this movie of just knowing when to cut somewhere else to reinforce, uh, not necessarily like something in the immediate plot movement, but reinforce the themes of the film. One of the, one of the most interesting character moments or sorry, camera moments in the story and I know this because I wrote it down because I was so I was so fascinated by it is there's this moment very early in the movie when we I think it's when we meet Roy Batty for the first time um, and he's he's meeting up with um gosh, we just said the guy's name and I forgot the other the other replicant um, uh, Leon Leon. He's meeting up with Leon. And basically, this is when he asks Leon, did you get your pictures? And he's like, no, there was someone else there policeman um and then they go off walking to eventually you know go meet with uh, Mm -hmm. a a biological engineer or something to do something and and the camera does this really interesting thing where they're they're sitting center frame and then they start walking away from the camera down the street and then the camera suddenly starts panning away from them to the left Mm -hmm. and it's not a scene transition because when we cut to that we cut we cut back to them Mm -hmm. just walking further down the street but all this does is it cuts it it removes them from the scene we pass by a column and they are completely cut out of the scene and all we see is just a bunch of people on bikes biking towards the camera Mm -hmm. and and in this moment we see you know it's it's all these like people in rags basically riding bikes coming towards the camera they're also there's just fire everywhere like this 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 world just has like fires burning constantly Mm -hmm. there are people just like sitting on the floor um you know this is where they live this is how they survive and it's this moment that i think like he saw in this moment to just just a brief pan away from our story to say to to remind us of what this world is to remind us of how people live in this world and then we cut right back to our two replicants and go on with the story but it was just this really interesting movement because normally 
I, I would maybe see a camera move like that if we're just preparing to transition. We're doing it as like a transition moment where we're leaving the scene and then going to move to new characters. So we kind of pan away from our characters, look at the world, and then cut to a new scene. This is... Um, this is the opposite of that. It's actually, we're going to cut right back to our character. So we leave our characters for absolutely no reason other than to reinforce the setting and the world. And it made me think of alien a lot. Cause I think we mm-hmm. called this out during our, our conversation around alien where there's just moments in the movie where everything just kind of stops to just like sit in the world of the ship and the atmosphere of the ship. And we just kind of live in that for a few moments and then pick up the plot and carry on. Um, and it, it, it was a move that really reminded me of that. Yeah, yeah, just um, um, it's it's I don't know. It's the equivalent of paying a lot of attention to the background of a sketch that you're drawing. Um, yeah, I, I keep thinking about sketching metaphors because n- now that I know that he draws these elaborate storyboards, you can imagine him thinking, you know, how do I how do I give the viewer a sense that this world extends beyond the edges of the frame? Yeah, and then and then one answer to that is just like, well, we we could literally have the camera just um, dolly to the left. And then we just leave our characters behind entirely and we see that the, the world just keeps going. And then you and then you're left with a subconscious impression for the rest of the movie that, yes, indeed, the world does just keep going in all directions. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, it, you're not just looking at a set. Uh, it really enhances the sense of um, of the depth and, and, and reality of what you're watching. Totally, totally agree. I love it. Yeah, that's, I, I, I know. I think that's a famous shot. That's a really great shot. I know exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Um, uh, but okay. So let's talk about Harrison Ford. Can we talk about Harrison Ford? <laughs> yeah, um, we can talk about Harrison Ford. I, I have a, I have what I guess might be a hot take here. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think Harrison Ford's a very good actor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I, uh. <laughs> I think so. Here's the, here's the problem with, uh-huh. with the statement I'm about to make. I think he's good in this movie. And I think the reason he's good in this movie is because Deckard is a shitty character who doesn't emote at all. And, and, and I think that Harrison Ford is perfect for this. Look, I, I think here's the thing. Harrison Ford is a very good looking man. I think he's a very charismatic man. I think he, he, his, his greatest skill as an actor is how he holds himself and how he moves his face. He's really good at these things. Um, Harrison Ford is terrible. At dialogue at least in this phase of his career and look i love star wars too um han solo's dialogue reads suck balls they're really <laughs> bad they're like like the the reason why the i know line works as a joke in return of the or in uh, empire strikes back is because it's not a very good line read it's it's stilted and clunky and that's every every time he talks in this movie i'm like you're reading a script and I, I think it works in this movie specifically for the reasons that Deckard is very clearly a replicant and uh, does not emote like a normal human being. But I don't know. Am I completely off base here, Matt? I don't think you're completely off base, although it is heresy. I'm going to have to report <laughs> you. Um, um, I don't think he's a, I don't think he's a bad actor. I mean, I think I agree with what you, what, with, what you actually said which is that he's not a is he not a very good actor i mean okay i I think he's i think he's fine in almost everything i've seen him in it's just that what he's really good at is swagger and and charisma Mm -hmm. that's why han solo and harrison and uh indiana jones are his are the roles we remember him as because he just he just it oozes masculine charisma and charm everywhere and and that's Mm -hmm. that's what's great about him and and also those are two roles where he gets to really do the physical part of acting where he gets to do action scenes like i've I've, he's really really good at getting his ass kicked and looking like he's having that he's just in horrible pain and he's about to die and he's terrified like that that's what he's like that that's what that's my favorite thing about him as an actor is that when he's in an action scene he never seems like i got this he's always like i'm about to die and i'm terrified and that's yeah. actually really good. It's it the quieter scenes where he's you know where, where he's having conversations. I agree are, are are not his best work. And this whole movie is that until the end, basically. I totally agree. He does this thing with his face when he's like in in, in desperate and yeah. and like barely hanging on, 
I think I think the be- the most clear image of it I can sum up is when in the Last Crusade when he's desperately trying to reach towards the the Grail and yeah. just barely getting it, and he like contorts his face in this way, like you can tell, he, like the the strain and the anguish at almost being able to get it. Yeah. And I think he's very very good at this, and I think this is repeated when he's hanging from the building here. It's really good work. I think it. You're absolutely right that physically his his physical chops as an actor are very very good, and he's he's very good at being the kind of action star that gets his ass kicked. The the late stage Tom Cruise type you know not the not the not the swaggery one that's going to come in and kick ass the swaggery one that's going to come in and get royally wrecked but still find a way to win the day he's he's very good at these things but yeah every fucking line read it's just not it's not great um it's Mm -hmm. not great at all yeah there's i mean there's a couple in the in the in the movie where you're just like i can we have another take uh, Harrison <laughs> but like I'm thinking specifically of when of when uh, uh, Rachel's in his apartment and he's telling her that she's a replicant I, I'm, I'm not going to repeat it because I don't remember the exact line but it's just it's so it's such a weird choice to do it that way and and you're just you don't buy you don't buy it you know mm-hmm. um, so I know I know what you're talking about there's most of the I, 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 I can say honestly 95% of the movie I was just like fine whatever this is this is the character deckard but then like a couple a couple moments i i I know what you're talking about but this is i mean honestly this is something i've always secretly felt about star wars is Mm -hmm. that like whenever i watch a new hope i'm sitting there watching all these actors on the set and every time harrison ford talks i'm just like i I don't believe the line (laughs) you're giving me in this moment like even even the the most iconic lines that are just like like um Ho- like hokey magic and old blah whatever are no um no trade off for a good blaster at your side kid or something like that i'm just like mm-hmm. i don't believe you when you said that line to me and i've always felt this about harrison ford and i've 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 always been afraid to say it and so now i'm going to say it <laughs> publicly on a podcast and get all these people I, mad at me but you like I just think it's funny because i think one of the reasons star wars works is that he's there being just some guy um, <laughs> sure and and that and and like without Harrison Ford, Star Wars was was way too nerdy and ridiculous. But yeah, yeah I, I know. And, and I I do think generally he's gotten better as he's gotten older too. I think like you work in the industry long enough and you can kind of get better at dialogue for sure. Um, this is very young, early Harrison Ford, and I don't think he's quite there yet. So yeah, um, I don't know if it's a Harrison Ford thing or what, but I, I definitely. Um, uh, uh, didn't like his character in this, in this, in this viewing, especially uh, I yeah. was like, this guy sucks. I mean, well, I, this is <sighs> hmm. Matt, this is a Ridley Scott thing. And this is why I uh, watching this movie. I was kind of reminded why I had the opinion. Ridley Scott is a robot and doesn't understand how people, how emotions work. And I think the real reason in this movie is because none of the central characters in this movie are human beings and don't quite understand how emotions work and they're struggling to understand things you know like this is what this movie is about is you have all these replicant characters like experiencing emotion and they don't quite know what to do because they also are fully aware that the memories they have were implanted the experiences that they've been told they experienced aren't quite real and they are treated not as humans but as things even though they are feeling all these complex things and so it creates this atmosphere this mood this this energy that everyone that talks to each other feels a little bit stilted feels a little bit emotionally off feels just a little bit cold and i mean it's it's definitely the intent of the movie for Mm -hmm. sure but it, it it creates this 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 very oppressive viewing experience where like you never feel warmth at any time in this movie yeah uh, ever right you're right it never quite feels human because indeed it is not um mm-hmm. and and that makes sense so um yeah no i i agree i agree though it's 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 a it's a thread that he continues to be interested in yeah and you know, there's a lot of threads that begin in this movie you know i think honestly he carries a lot of threads forward from um from from uh, alien and from blade runner and he he explores those over and over in different ways um the the idea of um the idea of of god as either a uh basically flawed cr- creature mm-hmm. who kind of doesn't actually know what it's doing 
um, y- your creator is actually a disappointment. That that is one of the themes of of this movie, o- or um, God as a sort of unknowable, sort of horrifying reality, which is <laughs> which is the xenomorph. Yeah. Um, and eventually he sort of. M- uh, uh, mixes the colors of these two themes in in later movies actually sure sure um, but he's very it, it, there's a lot of religion in alien there's a lot of religion in this movie um he's definitely exploring these these themes um, he's very interested in them um i say he you know obviously he didn't write the screenplay that's one thing that i i feel you know we we cover we cover writer, writer directors on this on this show a lot Mm-hmm. And and I, I slip into a mode of forgetting that not all directors are writer directors. <laughs> um, so so <laughs> bear, bears repeating here. Ridley Scott didn't write the script for Alien. He didn't write the script for Blade Runner. But I think he does have a lot of influence in the way that the movie gets made. Obviously, and I think that he, especially in the later movies, he begins to have a lot of influence on the story. Um, yeah, and I I agree. I mean, it, it is worth mentioning that yeah like at least none of the movies we've covered yet has he has had a writing credit but i think Mm -hmm. like going forward we can just kind of broadly say these are the movies he's choosing to make these are the stories he's choosing to take and Mm -hmm. and and film and so we can kind of say the story choices in these movies um reflect a desire of his more broadly perhaps less specifically than the writer directors we've covered in the past but still they reflected him in some way um, and, and making comparisons between uh, and, and contrast between the things he chooses to do in some movies and the things he chooses to do in the other, I think, are still valuable, regardless of the fact that that he didn't write the actual script. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, he, he is he is producer on most of the movies that he's done. Correct. Which pr- producer um, is, is a role that I think has even more sway on the story th- than the director does in some senses. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're the one that tells the director we don't have enough money to film that scene. <laughs> so you're going to have to find a, a new way of doing it. Um, but he, I mean, I, yeah. I, I think one of the things that stood out to me, especially in comparison to alien from last week is the ways in which the replicants are, are, are shown to be incredibly human. You know, like we talked about Ash, we talked about Ash as a symbol of not humanity, but inhumanity and, and the ways in which the look of Ash, the, the way Ash acts and the way Ash dies, uh, represent that. And, and the replicants here, like Roy Batty is sweaty and, um, you know, like when, when the replicants die, when Pris dies, she's like covered in blood, you know, mm-hmm. like the, and, and the movie cuts back to her laying there dead on the floor, bl- like with blood all over her body mm-hmm. as if like we talked, we talked last week about how the blood of Sigourney Weaver was used to contrast with the, the jizz milk of Ash mm-hmm. to show the distinction between human and not human. And here in this movie, three years later, he accentuates the blood and the sweat of these replicants. He really, he really, really wants you to see and understand that these, these are, are producing the same kind of liquid we do. Um, Mm -hmm. it is, he, uh, what is, I mean, the the central question I think that the movie kind of asks, maybe not directly is like, if you are, if you are so indistinguishable from a human being that it takes a specially trained person with a specially trained test to determine whether you are replicant or human, then what does it matter at that point? You yeah. you are in essence human, right? I mean, it is funny that what it really wasn't until watching Blade Runner twenty forty nine that I really asked those questions, and that's because that's a movie that's like, hey, this is the question you should be asking. Yeah, we've yeah. got Blade Runners who can breed. Uh, we've got replicants who can breed with humans. They're 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 human. Get it? Um, but <laughs> yeah. but like like you just said though, that's all in this movie. They 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 have flesh and blood and bone and, and eyes and and you know they have our genetic code. And you know even if you look at them with a microscope, you they look the same except that there's maybe yeah. a serial number. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's and they uh, and they dream and they I mm-hmm. mean they they want they feel yeah. they love the yeah. and and yeah in 2049 they can they can create life. I mean, that is the built that like that is the last key 
is the the creation of life i guess you could say although yeah. there's plenty of human beings out there that don't create life which is not to say that is a requirement of of humanity but well, but that is the one thing you could say is the one thing that no replicant could ever do and then the movies go no actually they they can yeah it, it sort of it sort of removes any idea that they're machines and it's like well they're yeah. they're a species now they mm-hmm. they can they yeah. can propagate themselves and i th- i think so much of the movie reflects that because like I-, I love i love when he he first runs into zora and she's got the snake and one of the first questions he asks her is that a real snake and she's like no of course not you think i could afford one of those and i'm sitting here like hey it looks like a fucking real snake to me folks and it's mm-hmm. just like it is it is a snake. Like they mm-hmm. just created a, a snake. They just made like the snake has gone extinct and they just made a new snake. And yeah. we're sitting here like quibbling over the differences between a natural existing snake and a, um, a, a biologically created snake that has, that is identical except for if you zoom in on one of its scales with your microscope, you can see a serial number. It's like, what is the difference at that? Why are we even, yeah drawing a difference between drawing a line between those well, two things yeah so so this is such a philip k dick question though like <laughs> like what you just like that's that's r- rife throughout all of his stuff is is sure. like and and you know it, it, yeah like it always has to do with you know what is real what it what is uh a facade um you know all of his stories are about you know people who aren't what they seem to be and and uh, uh, you know hallucinations and and you know dreams that are actually real and real things that are actually dreams and um, mm-hmm. you're you're not who you think you are sure. and just just this whole mishmash. I mean, I mean the 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 most interesting example to get sort of a lot of the same ideas but in a completely different package is Total Recall, um, <laughs> where yeah. it's it's like well that couldn't feel more different, but if you think about it a lot of the same themes are in there. Um, yeah. I, I feel like this movie doesn't really lean into the idea of memory very, very well. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. like it introduces the idea that these replicants are people that have memories implanted into them. So they've never experienced the memory. And it does have like one or two moments where like Rachel's like, you know, I, I love the scene where she goes to play the piano and then it's just like, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I could, I remember having the lessons, but obviously that wasn't, me experiencing that and i think that's a really great thing but i don't think oh i i feel like i feel like this is another area where blade runner 2049 really dives into that idea in a more explicit detail because it's definitely here in this movie right i mean yeah rudger Hauer's whole speech at the end that everyone talks about like tears and rain speech is about how all the memories all the experiences he has are just going to cease to exist when he ceases to exist um and so it's it's definitely like this idea of you know comparing and contrasting real experienced memory with artificial memory and what does that artificial memory create what how how are you defined as like how do you define you as a person if you have been implanted with memories that aren't quote unquote yours um and does that matter and again i think 2049 is just a movie that really really explores that concept in in much more um enjoyable detail to me but but it's yeah like like anything it's here in this movie yeah yeah right that's i think that's um we're doing a lot of that thing where what we're saying could be taken as criticism but it's actually just no yeah this discussion because i'm not because i don't think we're saying like it was it was bad that the movie didn't analyze the concept of memory in in as much detail as 2049 it's just like that's the style of this movie is we're kind of going to throw in some stuff about like if you have the memories of another person, are you, are you that person? Mm -hmm. Yes. No. Is there a clear answer to this question? Yeah. And the movie just kind of goes, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Moving on. The movie's more interested in in leaving you with the question than with Mm -hmm. answering it for you. And, Mm -hmm. and which, you know, to me, that's mature sci-fi by the way, is like, is like, don't, you know, if you can feed me an answer, then just write it a half paragraph essay on the topic and I'll read it. Like, like the interesting questions that really heady uh, thematic sci-fi struggles with are all the unanswerable questions of like, what is, what is mind? What is it to be a person? Um, you know, what is the meaning of our existence in this, in this universe? What is the yeah. meaning of this universe? Um, 
And these are the things that I think both Alien and this movie actually address. Yeah, and and I to be fair to 2049, I think I think it is equally opaque in some of the answers to these questions, right? Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's just it's just more interested in diving into certain questions than than the original Blade Runner did, which was kind of more broadly um all this like it is very ambitious film that is like taking it is doing all these things and taking all these ideas and just kind of throwing them into a movie and saying hey you people what do you make of this and i think it's 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 the exact type of thing that makes it i totally understand why it was not a successful movie on its first run you know like I I both understand completely why no one saw this on its first theatrical run. And I understand completely why this movie has become an iconic cultural classic because it is, it is not the movie that makes a lot of money. It is not the movie that you rush out to see in the movie theater, but it is the movie that you watch and think about for the rest of your life because it is, it is throwing questions in your face that you can't answer. And the movie is not going to give you an answer either. And so you have to sit there and think about it. Like, one actually you know we we talked we joked around about Deckard obviously being a replicant because he's obviously a replicant but one of the fun things of uh, of of the idea that he isn't is comparing and contrasting him a human being with Roy Batty a replicant and Roy Batty seems to have so much more life in him and emotion and experience. And so if we say, De- no, Deckard is a human being, Roy Batty is a replicant, then that comparison goes to show you, okay, well, what are we defining as human? Because if Deckard is a human, then maybe our definition sucks anyway, yeah. because Deckard sucks. Um, so I, I, like, I, I fully think he is supposed to be a replicant, but I like I like I enjoy thematically the read that says he isn't as well. So I don't I don't know I don't know if that <laughs> does anything, but I just that's why that's why this movie is just inherently and infinitely fascinating to me. Yeah, right. I, I think this is another thing we can pull out about Ridley Scott's whole approach is is mm-hmm. he's totally fine with leaving you with ambiguity. And yeah, I mean we talked about this idea with with Alien where um people have their you know their debates in their head canon about like you know um like what well, you know what we, we like like we said last week why did it um why did it kill brett but then only uh um uh, um you know kidnap the captain and then and then like oh well one of the cuts of the movie provides the answer but it's like well the main cut of the movie doesn't provide the answer. Mm. You're left to you're left to wonder for the rest of your life. <laughs> and, yeah. Um. And, and there's all sorts of other mysteries in that movie. And you know the whole mystery of where the alien comes from in the first place. Like like what is this? What is what is the ship that it's on? What what are these giant chambers in the ship that are full of eggs? And uh, you know, no movie will ever answer that question, unfortunately. <laughs> um. um uh, well, anyway, um, the point the point the point is that that really Scott he creates these you know these moments that like you just said they stick with you because they're not answered yeah yeah i i i love it man I, and yeah. i think i think that is a is a great place to end the conversation but yeah uh, so i guess uh, at the end of this where do you stand as far as this movie in the three that we've watched so far is this is is he getting incrementally better um where does this this fit if you were ranking these three right now um oh uh, it, it's really hard to compare against alien i mean i definitely mm-hmm. think alien and, and this movie are are better than than the, the duelists but that isn't that isn't a smear against the duelists because mm-hmm. alien and blade runner are timeless amazing classics yeah. um you know i think i think he's definitely more ambitious in terms of the sorts of information that he's trying to convey visually in this movie but i don't know yeah. if i could like prove that <laughs> i don't know <laughs> what what, are you, what is your feeling yeah i mean, i think i think alien to me is always going to be one of my favorite of his movies um mm-hmm. but i i was really surprised by just how much i enjoyed my time with this movie i really didn't expect it you know this is one of those weeks where i, I came into it like and i'm kind of writing writing what I'm going to say to you in the back of my head, even before I've watched the movie, which is like coming in and being like, I have something painful to admit, Matt. I've never really loved Blade Runner. Um, and I, I, 
didn't I mean, obviously, I didn't say that because I, I really enjoyed this movie on this rewatch. And so um, I do think Alien is more my speed. Like, I've never been a huge cyberpunk person. Like, it's just never been a genre that appeals to me. I love noir. And so the noir parts of this movie are the things that I appreciate the most about it. But the the cyberpunk genre itself has never been a huge draw for me. But um, it's, a, it's a really, really great, well done movie. And yeah. Yeah, I think my final my final remark on this movie will be I, I never realized that that um Deckard is the least interesting character in the whole movie. He, he is. And 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 actually it, it's kind of a better movie if you just go into it realizing that and just pay attention to everything that's happening mm-hmm. around him and maybe pay less attention to him um because you know you're biased toward toward paying attention to who you think is your protagonist because you expect mm-hmm. it to be their journey. And it's kind of not his journey. It's kind of, mm-hmm. it's just, it's just as much Batty's journey. It's just as much, um, uh, 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 God, <laughs> Jesus, um, the, the woman, Rachel, which one, Rachel, Ra- yeah, Rachel's journey. I mean, like Decker, what is his arc? You know, I don't know. Nah, he it, learns. He doesn't have enough of a character to have a character it, arc. That's that's the thing, right? It's like he started out retired and he ends up retired so yeah i mean i think um i think that's one of the things that makes this movie really brilliant to me is that i think a lesser version of this movie just makes roy batty the protagonist and is just a straightforward film about or where you know you start the film with these four people kind of sneaking their way into los angeles and then are kind of being systematically hunted and you could you know tell the, the same themes you know about personhood and identity and how we treat people and things and and what makes a human a human what makes a memory real or fake all these things you know you could still do the movie that way but choosing to enter this world and to enter these themes from the perspective of the person that is is employed to quote unquote retire these living breathing beings um is such a better way of entering into it and kind of lulling you into this false sense of of you're just kind of a, along the ride with Deckard until you until you know one or two moments that you pointed out the the the, the rape scene that each and every one of the murders he commits um it's gosh it's just so it's really really powerful um, yeah it's it's a really powerful method into kind of lulling you into this false sense of security and then beating you over the head with the the brutality of of what Decker does to these people who who you know have done really nothing wrong um yeah yeah they're they're escaping slaves yeah the last thing i'll say is that compared to alien when the robot um forces a phallic symbol down the throat of a woman in uh-huh. uh in a uh, blade runner uh daryl hannah's character uh almost kills deckard by jumping on him and shoving her vagina in his face uh-huh <laughs> Maybe, maybe, you know, trying to break his neck or crush his head with her thighs. It's, yeah. it's great. I um, wish she'd succeeded. Very, very sexual though, right? I mean, I, I don't yeah. think that's, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that. I mean, she was, she's the quote unquote pleasure bot, right? Yeah. And and so that is definitely a very yeah. intentional imagery here of of the pa- her, her powerful robot thighs almost destroying him. And in fact, like there's a scene there where it looks like, and I think I think his body just turns around. But when I watched it, I had to stop and go back because for a brief moment, it looked like she just turned his head entirely like 180 degrees around. Uh-huh. And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> How did she do that? Right. Um, no, no, I mean, he, he he turns with it, although you can't really see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I just OK. What I think is interesting about that is like she totally has him. And then for some reason chooses to go cartwheeling across the room to like wind up for another run. And then he just picks up his gun and shoots her. And it's mm-hmm. like, and, and I, I don't think this is a flaw of the movie. I think it's like, she's inexperienced and doesn't really know how to go about this. And she, and, and, and also she's kind of getting her revenge in a certain sense. Yeah. I mean, so, she's kind of a child in a lot yeah, of ways, which yeah. makes the, the, you know, programmed for sex part of this all the more disturbing. But like, yeah. I mean, we haven't, we didn't talk about that character very much, but the, when she dresses up like a doll, right? Like she's, mm-hmm. she's kind of dresses up as a toy in Sebastian's toy shop. And, uh, I, I found that, you know, really interesting to think about. Yeah, know. sure. That is interesting. Yeah. Good point. But she's definitely the most childish of the four of them for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think they all are, are a bit childish, actually. But yes, I agree with you. She is the most obviously yeah. childish. I mean, they all technically are less than four years old, each, each of them. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, every time Rutger Hauer has to emote, it's it's like a weird it's like a weird way of doing it because mm-hmm. it's like he doesn't really know how to emote. He's this yeah. is like the first time he's felt this emotion. Yeah, I mean, it goes to this idea of like you create a being, give it memories, and say go. And like so much of how we learn to exist in this world is through actual lived experience and they don't really have any of that. And so you basically like you, you made Rutger Hauer and gave him a gun and told him to go, go to war. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I guess you gave him memories and you think of him as a thing. And so it's fine. Actually, I don't even know if they gave him memories, right? Because he's yeah. not like implanted like Rachel is. So they probably didn't even feed them any memories. They just made a, right. a, a human and immediately equipped it with a weapon and said, go kill people or right. go sleep with people or go lift heavy things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gosh, and, it's and, terrifying. And this is why they do stuff like they have a bunch of pictures that they cherish. Yeah. Because that's like their whole life, uh-huh. you know? And it's it, that's another thing where it's like, you can really dig into the idea that he just is really upset that he's lost his pictures because mm-hmm. it's like that's all he has, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which um, it's it's really sad. These poor people. Yeah, I know. It's it's really easy if you just don't consider them people, and then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, they're just machines. <laughs> that is the conclusion of Blade Runner: is they're actually just machines, and we don't got to worry about it. And so is Deckard. <laughs> The end. Yes, the end. All right, so that was Blade Runner. Matt, the next Ridley Scott movie on our list is Legend, a movie I have not seen. Uh, I believe you have, right? Uh, yeah, a long time ago. I'm really interested in this because I don't know anything about this movie at all. But the first three Ridley Scott movies have been, I I would describe them as as heady movies. You know, like like very you know, there's, it's, there's horror, certainly there's action, but like, these are movies, these are thinking people's movies. Right. And I don't, is legend a a, a thinking people movie? I don't know. Um, I actually think it is, (laughs) Okay, but I haven't seen it since I was a kid. I'm not sure. Um, sure. Like, I I think my impression is that I saw it as a kid and a lot of stuff went over my head, but there's, I, I'll just, I'll just say there's some, there's some religious imagery in the movie. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Well, it's going to be fun. So we will uh, we will be covering Legend next. I believe we're going to be taking a quick a quick break from Ridley Scott next week um, because we have to do our our uh, Doof Cannon episode for the month. But after that, we will get right back to Ridley Scott with Legend. Do 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 doof. All right, Matt. We have to talk about Netflix. Yes. So uh, for those that don't know, um, Netflix uh lost what was it um 54 billion dollars in a single day that's a good question i, w- I want to look up what I, the, the actual detail um the main thing that i noticed is that their stock tanked by 35 percent. 35 percent, which is horrible like mm-hmm. like i i think that they might literally just be going out of business yeah. So yeah, that that fifty billion in market cap basically gone in the course of a day, and and what happened is uh, they came out with their quarterly results from the first quarter of twenty twenty two, and they posted a subscription loss for the first time in ten years. They lost two hundred thousand subscriptions in the first quarter of twenty twenty two. And um, I think the thing, if you look at at, I think it's not just the the subscription loss, Matt, but it's also they forecasted another two million lost subscriptions by the end of the year is uh-huh. what they're currently forecasting, which is insane. I mean, they have a lot of subscribers. Like I think Netflix has like uh gosh, how many subscriptions does Netflix have? Like a shit ton. A metric shit ton. Like millions and millions and millions. Uh-huh. So like two million is not like uh it's it's not like they're gonna lose half their subs in well. by the end of the year. But but so but like there's a lot of bad news. So you know what's happening now is they've they've just recently increased their uh, price point yeah, to a to, level. I think twenty dollars a month is the max the the four yeah. K amount now, which is it's a lot. That's twenty a lot. bucks a month is a lot. Like 
that's a number that actually makes me go like, wait a minute, do I really need Netflix? Because, and and then like, like that's the thing. The last thing you want is your customer saying, do I really need this service? Because the answer is no. Mm-hmm. You know, I like, like I can, I can get every movie from Amazon prime. I might have to pay, you know, three or four bucks to watch it, but you know, Netflix, uh, you know, um, they don't have, they don't offer that much, right? Yeah. Netflix has quietly become my least used streaming service right now. I use Apple TV plus HBO max Hulu and Disney plus far more than I use Netflix. Um, and it, I mean, I still watch it on occasion. There's still stuff on there, but the, Netflix has really, really invested in the reality TV market. They they are constantly introducing new reality television shows. They are constantly introducing like these kind of bottom of the barrel, cheap to produce movies um, that are relatively popular. But none of it is a killer app. None of it is like even The Power of the Dog, which is a movie that almost won the Academy Award for Netflix this past year. That's not a thing that makes you sign up for Netflix. And that's not a thing that makes you keep Netflix. And especially as they keep raising prices, Matt, the other thing that they are probably going to do is they're going to cut off password sharing. So this has been in the Netflix terms of service, you know, from the beginning that you are not allowed to share your password with people outside of your household. They have never enforced this because they've never needed to, because they were growing. And, and in their mind, me sharing my password with my family just perhaps increases the opportunity for, you know, them to get their own subscription down the line or them to become p- uh, regular watchers of Netflix TV shows and then spread the word and marketing, blah, blah, blah. But as they continue to lose subs, they're probably going to introduce, and they're already testing this in some markets, ways of, you know, either via IP blocking or some other method of preventing you from sharing your Netflix password with other people. Mm-hmm. And I understand why they're doing it. I think it's a mistake uh, that's going to really like, here's the thing with Netflix, the thing, the least, the, <laughs> the business strategy at this point has to be remind people they're paying for Netflix as little as possible. Right. right? <laughs> um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So any change in your formula that reminds a person they're paying for your service, AKA uh, upping your monthly charge, telling people they can't share it anymore, um, adding a version of the service that has ads, which is something they're also talking about. They're also talking about, you know, we can increase the price for the premium, no ad service, but you can pay for a a cheaper price, AKA what it used to cost like five years ago. You can get us a version of this thing that also has advertisements in it. That's definitely something they're going to do down the line. But all these things all remind people that they're paying for Netflix. Yeah. And that's not good. I think we talked a few years ago about Netflix is entire business model at this point was completely dependent on growth. They were a company that has never made money. They've always spent more money than they, they brought in, which is insane considering how many subscribers they have. And now suddenly the, the, the fun train has, has derailed and they are losing subscribers, which means they are losing valuation, which means how do they make, how do they stay in business? How do yeah. they stay in business? I don't know the answer to that question. I think I think we're going to see them start to sell off shit. They're going to start to sell things. Uh, IP rights, you know, most their most popular shows. Like what if they can give what if they can give Stranger Things to Disney for like 50 mil or something like that, you know? I I I don't know. I don't know where this goes, but I I just yeah. it's it's bad. It's bad. Yeah, I mean it, they they were always um they they had the advantage of being kind of the front runner in terms of mm-hmm. of of starting before everyone else. Yeah. But the problem they always had was that they don't actually own content, and so they tried to catch up by making a bunch of content. And they did that thing where they were like algorithmically generating the content, where they would be like, "Everybody loves Ryan Reynolds. Let's <laughs> let's have seventeen different Ryan Reynolds vehicles." But um, that Ryan Reynolds movie that came out this year is one of the most watched things on Netflix, according to Netflix. But like, but. that's the thing. That's the thing is if you are already a Netflix subscriber and you boot up your, your smart TV and you see new Ryan Reynolds movie. Okay. But are you going to, are you going to sub for that? Or exactly. are you going to like, is that the thing that keeps you maintaining your subscription? 
exactly. Like no, nobody, nobody said, "Oh, this movie was amazing. You desperately need to get Netflix so that you can watch this Ryan Reynolds movie." That that mm-hmm. didn't happen. All it did was it made you feel for one more month, like, "Yeah, I, I guess I, I, I guess I should keep my Netflix subscription," you know. And <laughs> and then every once in a while, something random like Squid Game happens, which is really just them kind of throwing the dice and being like, "Ah, oh, thank God we." accidentally bought that one Korean drama that people are now going crazy about because th- this will yet again make people think that that it was a good decision to buy Netflix when in yeah. reality it, in reality it's b- perversely it's like the only reason a show like Squid Game becomes popular is if your offerings are so scanty that people are tr- tr- like just trying to find anything that's even somewhat entertaining and then they accidentally find the Korean drama which happens to be good Sure. Can you name one original currently running Netflix produced television show? Um it is 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 it Cake uh Netflix? <laughs> yes. Yes. And that you're right and that's part of the problem. Yes. Like <laughs> they have you know and I understand like they have gone into the reality TV TV business in the same way a uh, network television has gone into the reality TV business because it's cheap to produce and mm-hmm. people watch it that it, I, it totally makes sense. I understand why all these people end up eventually just making reality TV over and over again. Here's the thing though. I, I think people watch a lot of reality TV. I think Netflix just released a show called ultimatum, which by the way, I have to talk to you about because it's the fucking craziest fucking television show I've ever seen in my entire life. It's absurd. It'll blow your mind. That's a conversation for a different day, but Nobody signs up for Netflix because of Ultimatum. They watch Ultimatum on Netflix because it's there and they're already paying for the service. That is not a, a, a service retention device. And I do not think reality TV broadly is a service retention device. I do no. not think it is. Reality TV is the mindless shit you put on your TV while you're sitting there on your phone or doing something else or doing the dishes. It is perfect background tv material and no one is going to seek out and pay extra money for background tv material they're just going to move to whatever other background tv material they can get so they don't need your service for it you're not providing a a, a exclusive service there no And, and i really don't think they can ever compete with the platform that will always be the best platform for reality tv which is of course youtube Um, (laughs) that is that is very true because like what is a youtuber other than a self-made reality TV star. That, like that's yeah. that's yeah, that, point. That's that's what all of the big YouTubers are. Like that, mm-hmm. it, nobody uses that term, but that's what it is. Yeah, so I, I think they're in trouble. I mean, I I don't I don't know where this ends exactly, but I I was kind of waiting for this honestly. Like I think the pandemic in a in a warped kind of way prevented this from mm-hmm. happening two years ago. I mm-hmm. think this is where Netflix was always heading, and then the pandemic happened. And nobody could do anything. And so subs shot up again. And because everyone is using Netflix and now we've kind of caught up two years later to where Netflix was two years ago. And uh, Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's going to be bad. And I don't, I don't, I mean, I feel for the people that work there certainly. Um, But yeah, I mean like if I'm looking at my current subscriptions and the insane amount of TV subscriptions I currently have, which I, I have a truly insane amount, uh, this is the one I'm most willing to get rid of right now right. because, you know, yeah, I watch Squid Game. I would like to watch Stranger Things when it comes out, although I'm not a huge fan of that either. Um, but that's that's really that Stranger Things yeah. is all they have at this point, Matt. I, I think and that's going to last. That's going to last for two weeks because they still do the binge model. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What's. Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, at this point, I think I could subsist on just Amazon Prime and Disney mm-hmm. Plus. Mm-hmm. I mean, frankly, I could submit, I could subsist on just Amazon Prime, except Disney Plus is actually a better deal um, because they, they, there's so many actually good movies that are on Disney Plus. Yeah, I mean, I could literally, if I needed to, I could cancel everything but Apple TV Plus right now because that's how much stuff I'm watching on Apple TV Plus that I absolutely love. Um, mm-hmm. HBO which, Max as well. HBO Max as well, which segues nicely into. <laughs> yes. Um, our next segment, TV trade off. So basically, all this means, I, I, I call it a segment, but really, all this means is that Matt watched a television show 
and he wanted me to watch it so we could talk about it on the episode. And I didn't really want to, but I saw this as an opportunity to make Matt watch a television show so we could talk about it on an episode. And so that's what we're doing now. So yeah. Matt, tell me about the show that you decided to watch. Uh, the show that I decided to watch was Raised by Wolves, which is extremely appropriate to this conversation about Ridley Scott because Ridley Scott is one of the major producers and driving forces behind the show. I believe he directed the first episode of season one as well. He did I direct believe. the first episode of season one. Um, it is a show that contains within it actually a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about in um, while talking about Ridley Scott in general. Um, but it's it's to to my in my opinion as the show goes on, I think because it's a TV show and not a movie, it's able to um, explore a lot of the individual ideas with more um, patience and, and nuance and um, depth than the movies ever are. Like we, we just talked about this idea that, you know, there will be a, a moment in Blade Runner that's just a little, a little taste of an idea and then it moves on and you're just left to kind of gnaw on that. Well, this is a TV show that I think takes these sci-fi premises and really kind of, runs in in different directions and goes goes deeper with them and, and allows you to explore them and it's really interesting and i i think it's just a really well made show i think it's awesome i think it's delightfully weird uh i i one thing i've said about it is like um i'm i'm just shocked that that something this weird is on normal person tv <laughs> because like i i'm i'm just continually delighted by where they're willing to go with the story and the the weird shit they're willing to do, um, I'm just, and I don't know what else to say uh, as a, as a sales pitch other than I'm really into it. I know that you are not as sold on it as I am, but um, mm -hmm. I hope I hope in the process of talking about it, we're able I'm able to to get you more more excited about it. We will see. And this is actually Matt. Uh, th this is why I'm extremely angry with you. Actually, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so I have watched the first season of this show already. Um, I did not like it very much and I did not watch season two. Um, I have over the past five years recommended probably <laughs> 70,000 television shows to you Sounds that I said, right. Matt, you need to watch the show. Uh -huh. The one time you decide to go watch a show, uh -huh. it is the one show I specifically did not recommend to you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened is my mom came to visit and she was like, <laughs> this is a great show. You'll love this show. Um, and then she basically was like, I'm going to put it on. And then I was like, all right, fine, I'll watch it. And then I loved it. And then I, and then, and then once, you know, I think she and I watched the first two episodes and then I really loved it. So I did, I finished the rest by myself, but it was because I, I had already been hooked on it. Um, so the, the moral of that story is if you want me to watch a show, Scott, you got to come visit me and then make me watch it physically, physically put it on my TV and say, this is what we're watching tonight. Okay. No, actually, the lesson I've learned here is I just need to reach out to your mom and oh. tell your mom what you need to be watching. That might actually take work. care of it for me. Yeah, please do that, actually. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, the show that I am going to make you watch in exchange for me rewatching season one of a show I didn't like and then watching the entirety of season two of a show I didn't like. But hopefully we'll we'll grow to like over the course of this. Uh, I am going to make you watch a show that I just finished that just wrapped up its first season it is on Apple TV Plus, so you've got to figure out how to deal with that, Matt. But the show I'm going to make you watch and the show we will eventually do an episode of the Doofcast on is Ben Stiller's new, um, <laughs> difficult to explain exactly what genre this thing fits into, but the name of the show is Severance. Um, the, the overarching concept of the show is in the, I guess, technically near future. Um, there is a company that masters the ability to kind of carve the human brain in two um, so that when you are away from work, you have your life away from work where you just you know live your life and enjoy your everything. And then when you get into the elevator to go down to your office in work, um, you pass a thing and it flips a switch and you become a different version of yourself that has no memories of your life outside of work and just works for eight hours and then leaves and you have no memories of work person and work person has no memories of outside person. And, and that's what they call severance in this thing. It is a, um, gosh, how to explain what, what type of show it is, Matt. It, it is, 
a very strange, surreal examination of human beings relationship to work, to work culture, to corporations, to um, how we define meaning in our life and, and, and what makes us people. Um, It's, it's all over the place in a lot of really, really fascinating ways. Um, It is, it is technically a mystery box show, um, but I think it is one of the mystery box shows that at least in the first season has managed to avoid the trap that a lot of mystery box shows fall into. I think um, it is definitely the type of show that there are numerous Reddit threads picking apart every little bits and pieces and detail and trying to suss out what it means and what's going on. And I don't, th- I, I, I strongly suggest you and anyone else that is going to watch these shows along with us do not delve into that type of stuff. Just watch the show and enjoy it for what it is. The Reddit stuff I think is just, I don't like it. I don't like it. Um, But, but that's severance. It's on Apple TV plus there are nine episodes. It has already been uh, greenlit for a second season, which they are working on right now. Um, It's directed by Ben Stiller, who has kind of quietly become a really fascinating director who is, um, he made a, a series for Showtime. I believe it was called from escape from Danamora a couple of years ago and now he's directed uh i think half of the episodes of the show um really really interesting stuff lots to talk about for sure and uh, i hope you enjoy it matt yeah um it's it's funny i i also have enjoyed um late career ben stiller um yeah quite a bit uh can't think of anything i've seen super recently but uh, i do look forward to this i mean this sounds like it's right up my alley i'm, I'm yeah. not I'm, I'm not actually mad that you're making me watch this this is a uh, this is gonna be. This is gonna be great. I got. I totally got the better end of this deal. I mean, I mean, not <laughs> I, really I, because Raised by Wolves is great, and you're wrong. But um. <laughs> I am pretty confident that you are gonna find a lot to enjoy in this thing for sure. Um, so yeah. Uh, so that, that is it. So uh, this is not something we're going to like come back next week and talk about. It's obviously going to take me some time to watch all 20 so episodes of raised by wolves. It's going to take Matt a little bit of time to watch all nine episodes of severance. Um, and we will do a full episode on each of those sometime in the future, but we just wanted to give everyone a heads up. So if they wanted to participate in those conversations and listen to us talk about these shows, they would also have time to watch the shows. Uh, once again, raised by wolves is on HBO max severance is on Eight, uh, eight, I don't know why I keep saying at t <laughs> Apple, Apple TV Plus. Very so that's cool. All right. That's what we're doing. I, 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 this is a fun idea. I like this. I think it is. I think, and we'll have to do it. If, if it's successful, we'll have to do it again with more shows. Although I feel like it's rare. <laughs> it's rare for you to be like, Scott, I got this show that you really need to watch. Yeah. yeah. Now I see your ploy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, Matt, you don't have one. Uh, well, we can just do mine then. Yeah, That's we'll just fine. do mine, and you know, yeah. if you find one later, then we'll do yours. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. That's going to do it for us this week. If you have any opinions on anything we talked about today, including uh, Blade Runner or Blade Runner twenty forty nine, or if is Harrison Ford a good actor or not, or uh, you, just your opinions about Netflix. How often do you use use Netflix? Do you still like it? Are you going to cancel your service? Um, what is your opinion on Netflix and? Uh, uh, any anything of that variety you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com over on our twitter account at doofmedia or on our subreddit that's r slash doofmedia there will be a post for this very episode of the show and that would be a perfect place to let us know what you think about deckard and harrison ford and if either or both of them are replicants that's right and if you're not already subscribed to the Doofcast, then we encourage you to subscribe and sh- ensure you never miss an episode especially of this ongoing ridley scott series uh, you can find the Doofcast on apple podcasts stitcher youtube google play and pretty much anywhere else you can find podcasts and if you like what we do here and want to support us consider becoming a patron of doof media you can head on over to patreon.com slash doof media and pledge at the $5 level or any level, uh, which gives you access to a bunch of cool bonus features, including uh, what, we, what we call doof after dark, which is really just when Matt and I get on a mic or, you know, any of the the doof partners get on a mic and just talk about whatever random shit we're thinking about. Um, I think this week's episode of doof after dark exemplifies this idea the most where you just talked about cars for like 20 minutes and I talked about basketball for like 20 minutes. And then we also talked about fish and birds. Um, it was a really random conversation, but exactly what you would expect from Doof After Dark. It was perfect. It was a perfect conversation. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, also, please consider reading and reviewing the Doofcast on Apple Podcasts because every review does help us to get more exposure and introduces new people to the little podcasting community we got going on here. That's right. And that is at last going to do it for us this week. As we said, we are taking a quick break from Ridley Scott to do our Doof Cannon episode of the month. We have not quite gotten a selection for what that movie is going to be, but uh, we'll be back next week to talk about whatever movie that ends up being. And then we'll be back the week after that to continue our journey with Ridley Scott with his next film, Legend. So one way or another, we'll see you soon, Ridley. And you'll do what I say. Woof, woof. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woof.